Welcome to Data Skeptic Time Series. This is Data Skeptic Time Series, the podcast about how to predict the future based on historical sequential data. Episode number. Although I no longer make daily observations of the data, a year ago today, I was making daily checks of the COVID-19 statistics for my local area as well as the country and the world. My interest in the topic was mere curiosity, but for many elected officials and corporate leaders, those statistics and a forecast of where they would be in the future were and are critical to making informed operational decisions. Today on the show, I speak with Rob Heinemann, author of Forecasting, Principles and Practice. We discuss this free online textbook that I highly recommend, as well as his work doing forecasting on COVID-19 data. Hi, I'm Rob Heinemann. I'm a professor of statistics at Monash University in Australia. Well, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here, Carl. I think our listeners are aware statistics is a broad and beautiful field. Do you have any particular specializations within that? These days, it's often known by other words like data science is, is covers statistics, but it covers more than statistics. It's the whole data wrangling, data management, and machine learning sort of get added on to what is traditionally statistics to make a very broad and interesting and diverse field. Well, you are also the author of Forecasting, Principles and Practice. Just to kick it off, can you tell me a little bit about the book? Yeah, so that's my uh, third forecasting textbook. Uh, the other two were with commercial publishers, and I didn't have a great experience. So I decided if I was ever going to write another one, I'd do it online for free so that my students could get access to something that was good and didn't have to pay ridiculous amounts of money to publishers that didn't really provide a good service. So uh, about seven or eight years ago, I put that up online, and it's now into its third edition and doing really well. We have a about 20,000 readers on the website every day. Very cool. Yeah, I've been through it myself. And I found it to be a good refresher in spots and some new information as well. I guess we should talk a little bit more about who the book is for. Is this a graduate text or can anybody get started with this? So we had in mind a few different audiences. One was our own undergraduate and master's students. So we wanted to create a book that was suitable for them. And secondly, for practitioners who potentially have training in data science, but maybe not have ever learned about time series or forecasting and need to sort of get up to speed quickly so that they can do forecasting for whatever organization they work for. So we've tried to make it practical, but also provide enough of the foundations for students. Are there any subtleties to the wording like time series and forecast? Should we read into those or are they just synonyms? No, I don't see them as synonyms at all. I think forecasting is, uses some time series ideas, but it's much bigger than just time series because you can do forecasting with non-time series type models. So when we talk about time series, you normally mean a sequence of observations collected over time. When we talk about forecasting, we mean predicting something in the future. And so obviously... If you have a good model of time series, you can create good forecasts, but you may not have enough data to create a time series model. You may not have any data, but you still want to create forecasts. So there are other ways of doing forecasting that do not involve time series. And when we look to just the things, I guess, in canonical time series, what are some interesting data points or ways in which people look at those data sets? So historically, people have collected regular time series. It might be one per year or one per quarter or one per month. And then they've built models that are uh, you know, statistical models that describe the evolution of those time series of the data points over time. But it's becoming more interesting as data is higher frequency. So these days, we often get daily data, hourly data, even minute by minute data. And so we need different types of models to handle the higher frequency data that have other sort of patterns in them that you just cannot get in the low frequency data. For example, in quarterly and monthly data, you might have a seasonal pattern. But if you've got hourly data, you can have three different seasonal patterns happening at the same time. You can have a time of day pattern, a day of week pattern, and a time of year pattern all going on simultaneously. So you need models that will handle those sort of complexities, which makes it really interesting, I think, because there's a lot more going on with you know, modern large data sets. You can, I guess, run some risk of increasing that frequency and getting a huge increase in the amount of data you have. If there's some information there, obviously you want to do that, but it could also be information overload. I don't know that there's a rigorous from first principles way to decide on that kind of stuff, but do you have any guiding principles for how one should determine something like their observation rate? 
Yeah, you've got two things happening there. The higher frequency data, you generally have more data and therefore you can fit more sophisticated, more complicated models. But on the other hand, they can also get very noisy. And if you think about, for example, sales data, retail sales, if you've got number of sales or total income from sales in a store, then if you get down to minute by minute level, you're going to have a lot of zeros and ones and not much signal there in the data to use for forecasting. So generally, I say to people, you want to have the data at the level of aggregation that you need the forecast. If you're creating forecasts and you only need to know daily forecasts because you're working out what staffing levels you need in your store and you need to know and people are you know work all day, then there's no point having data frequency that's any higher than what you need to forecast. But sometimes say uh, you'll need to have relatively high frequency data just to build an interesting model. You touched on one example of a commercial application. I guess in some ways, every industry has time series problems, but are there any particular use cases that stand out as good examples? Yeah, as you say, anywhere you collect data over time and you're interested in the future, which most organizations are, then you've got a forecasting issue. Uh, My own work tends to have focused on retail and energy and demography. So I've done quite a lot of work on energy forecasting where you're trying to predict the demand for electricity or the demand for gas over the short term so you can make sure there's enough supply to meet the demand but also over the long term so you can think about the generation capacity that you need. So I've done quite a bit of work in that space. I've worked in retail where you're generally trying to forecast daily or weekly demand so that you can make sure you've got the stock on hand for the customers when they come to purchase. And I've done a fair bit of work in demography, things like mortality forecasting, fertility forecasting, population forecasting. And there it's much more long term because things change slowly. And you might be forecasting up to 50 years ahead and the interest might be, you know, what's the aged population going to be like in 40 or 50 years so that you can think about, do you have enough people working to pay for the aged pension? You know, do you have enough aged care facilities? Do we need to start planning new ones and so on? And do these different use cases require different algorithms or approaches? Or on the contrary, is there a universal approach that seems to work well in general? Every application will have some things that are unique about it that will need some modifications to the model. But then there's some underlying principles that underlying model components that will often be, you'll find in lots and lots of different applications. So the underlying things that you'll often see, you know, simple time series models like ARIMA models or ETS models, which work well for time series where there's no other covariates to worry about. But then if you do have covariates, you'll often combine those with some kind of regression or nonlinear relationships between the Thing you're interested in forecasting and the covariates, and then you'll have an ARIMA process on the end to handle the other bits and pieces. Or if you're doing demographic forecasting, we might use a principal components decomposition, but then the ARIMA model will get used for the scores of the principal components. So you'll often find some of the same things crop up in different contexts, but put together in different ways to tailor it for the particular application. So my take on it is that someone implementing good time series approaches needs to make a few choices along the way about methodologies. You know, do they combine some of these things? Does anything need to be smoothed or normalized or whatever? I mean, obviously those have to be decisions informed by the data, but broadly speaking, is there a flow chart I can follow or is that just a a case by case problem? I've never seen a flowchart that really puts that together. I'm not sure that you could produce one. It's a lot of experience in understanding the difference between signal and noise. And I think that's one of the things that people struggle with as they see, you know, the data jumping around all over the place and they might imagine that those fluctuations are predictable when in fact it might just be random noise. So one of the things you have to learn is to think about what is really the signal here, what is the predictable part of what you're seeing and what is just randomness. That's a bit of a nuisance, but you have to sort of deal with that level of uncertainty. And the more time series you look at, the more forecasting you do, the better you get at sort of having an intuition for where the signal lies and where the noise is. And so often I find particularly people with computer science backgrounds will often try to model what's essentially the noise and because they don't have a good understanding of the uncertainty. And people from a statistics background usually are more comfortable with the uncertainty, but they will often not build particularly sophisticated models for the signal part of it. So there's stuff to learn from different disciplines here, I think. One discipline we tend to touch on a lot on the show, just because it's the the flavor of the last couple of years, is deep learning. Uh, What, if any, impact have these types of models had on time series analysis? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually been a really interesting thing to look at how neural nets and deep learning in particular has impacted forecasting. So if you go back to the late 1990s was the first real attempts to apply neural networks in a forecasting context. And they did very badly. They were overfitting to time series that were not particularly long. There was a famous competition called the M3 competition, which was run in around 1998. And the results were published in 2000 and the neural nets did badly. And so another competition was was followed up where people tried to find time series that they thought where neural nets would work well. And again, standard statistical models outperformed them easily. And you come forward to the M4 competition, which was held in only a few couple of years ago. Um, it was the first time that you had neural nets really outperforming other sorts of methods in a large scale forecasting competition. And the difference was just the size of the data set. M4 competition, there was 100,000 time series, whereas back in the M3 competition in the late 1990s, there was only 3,000 time series and they were short time series. So it needed a much, much larger set of data. And it also needed a model that would fit to the whole collection of time series rather than try to do it one series at a time, which is what had been happening before then. So in the last two to three years, we've seen deep learning start to really have an impact in forecasting, but only when there's a very large collection of time series and the neural net is applied to the entire collection, not one series at a time. I don't know that that'll ever change because, in fact, I can't imagine you get an advantage from the deep architecture if you're dealing in sparse or rare data conditions. So it seems like for certain we need to know and be aware of the more traditional techniques, even if we also embrace the neural network techniques. Yeah, that's right. And some of the best applications in full competition were um, a combination. So people would fit a statistical model to each series and they'd take some of the components of that model and feed them into a big deep learning neural net and to get sort of updated forecasts. And that worked better than either fitting a deep learning neural net to the whole series or fitting individual models. It was the hybrid approach which worked well. I think there's a lot to learn from the sort of the older methods, but in conjunction with some newer machine learning ideas. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the programming packages you've released. These will give people a jump start experimenting and exploring these techniques. Give me the lay of the land there. What are the, some of the options you've made available? So I started work on writing R packages. In fact, it was before R existed. I was writing S plus code back in the late 1990s when I was doing consulting work for lots of different organizations. And I put my code out as on my website in case anyone else was interested. And eventually I thought I should turn this into a proper package. So it became an R package in around 2006, what was called the forecast package. And it's still around and still extremely widely used. It's been updated a zillion times since then. But last year, for example, it had 3 million downloads. So I know there's a lot of people still using it. In the last two years, though, I've really stopped actively working on that other than maintenance and bug fixes. And these days I'm working on a new collection of packages which are designed to handle the higher frequency series and to handle more time series simultaneously. So one of the problems I had with the forecast package, although it's extremely successful and works really well for what it does, it really is designed for lower frequency series, so annual, monthly, quarterly, and for one series at a time. If you have lots of different series, it's not designed for that use case. You'll have to write loops or something if you have to fit to lots of series. Whereas my new collection of packages, which work together in a seamless way, can handle any sort of time series with whatever timestamp you like, and it's designed to handle thousands or even millions of series simultaneously. So those packages fit in with the Tidyverse collection of R packages, which are made famous by Hadley Wickham and the R studio crowd. And so our new collection of packages works with those. There's the Tibble package, T-S-I-B-B-L-E, which handles time series data frames. And then there's the Fable package for forecasting and the Feasts package for features and statistics for time series. Thanks to this week's sponsor, ExpressVPN. How did you choose which internet service provider to use? The sad thing is most of us have no choice in ISP. They operate as monopolies and they use monopoly power to take advantage of customers. But worst of all, many ISPs log your internet activity and sell that data to other big tech companies or advertisers. To prevent ISPs from seeing your internet activity, protect all of your devices with ExpressVPN. What is ExpressVPN? 
It's a simple app for your computer or smartphone that encrypts all of your network data and tunnels it through a secure VPN server so that your ISP cannot see any of your activity. Just think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, the list of people you've messaged, sites you visited, and videos you've watched get tracked by tech giants who can sell that information for profit. That's the reason why I recommend ExpressVPN as the best way to hide your online activity from your ISP. Just download the app, tap one button on your device, and you're protected. ExpressVPN does all of this without slowing down your connection. That's why it's rated the number one VPN service by CNET and Wired. Visit expressvpn.com slash dataskeptic. Using that code expressvpn.com slash dataskeptic will get you three months free. So one more time, head to expressvpn.com slash dataskeptic to learn more. I have seen an emergence of some higher level tools that kind of want to automagically analyze your time series for you and spit out a generic forecast. So I guess those are great if they work nicely, but it can also be that someone just tries them and because they get a result, they assume they've got a good forecast. Do you have any thoughts in general on those uh, sort of automagic solutions, either way, you know, positive or negative? In some ways, I'm positive because I've written some of them myself. Two of my algorithms are very widely used, Auto.Arima and ETS and they're both completely automated. They work fine if you've got univariate time series that you know, has trend and seasonality and you don't have other things to put in them, like you don't have other covariates or predictor variables that you'd want to take into account. But as soon as you're trying to do something more sophisticated, they will generally not do as good a job. What I always recommend is that if you need something automated, and you often do, if you've got thousands of sales products that you need to forecast you know, every week, you're going to have to automate it in some way. So what I suggest people do is to try a few different tools and compare them on out of sample forecast accuracy. So if you're sitting here and three months ago, how would they have done for the last three months? If you're sitting here two months ago, how would they have done for the last two months? So you can have a evaluation on genuine out of sample data and see whether your tools do well compared to other options and choose the ones that do the best. Often I find people are picking tools that are easily available or convenient, but not necessarily the best. Or they'll find some tool that they think sounds sophisticated or it comes from an organization that they think is, you know, those people should know what they're doing, but it doesn't necessarily give you the best forecast. So always do some empirical out of sample evaluations to see what models work well on your data. Well, I'd love to transition into a real world and contemporary use case. I know you've done some forecasting work related to COVID-19 data. Can you give me a sense of what your work was there? Yeah, so in... Uh, Early 2020, it was probably late February or early March when it was obvious that this pandemic was going to have a serious effect on the entire world. And every country was trying to put together people that could forecast COVID-19 cases for their governments to handle various policy responses. And so the Australian government tried to ask a group of us to put together a set of forecasts every week for the last, uh, well, ever since March 2020. So there's a team of people that involves some epidemiologists, some mathematicians, some statisticians, and forecasters like me. And so we meet every week and we have a collection of models that we use. And those forecasts go to the different state governments and the national government of Australia, to the premiers and to the health officers, the chief health officers at each level. And the way it works is we have an ensemble, which often works better than any individual model. So an ensemble of forecasts means that you have multiple models that get applied to the data, and then we combine the forecasts to get an overall ensemble forecast. The three different models that we use in Australia are a standard epidemiological model, well, not so standard, it's quite a sophisticated epidemiological model that we've adapted for the Australian context. So it's called an SEIR model, which is sort of one of the standard ones used in epidemiology, which divides the population into groups. There's the susceptibles and infected and recoverers and so on. And then it models the flows between those groups. We have an agent-based model, which tries to model people's individual behavior. And we use for that uh, various mobility data sets from the tech companies such as Apple and Facebook and Google. And they tell us how much people are interacting in shopping centers or parks or workplaces and so on. And those interact and inter mobility data sets modeling people's interactions or describing people's interactions go into our model to then predict COVID-19 cases. And we have a large time series model which uses data from every country in the world for which we have data from the Johns Hopkins database. And we use that to predict as well. 
well. So each of these three models forecasts COVID-19 cases for the next six weeks on a daily basis. They each produce probabilistic forecasts. So that gives us a range of the different numbers that could occur and what the probabilities attached to those numbers are. And then we just combine those together to form a probabilistic ensemble forecast which goes to the government. And that's been very effective and it's driven Australia's policy response. So when we say the probability of an outbreak is you know, a certain percentage, then the government might take some action in response to that. So this virus is, uh, as they say, a novel virus. This is the first time in contemporary history we have data like this. So it's not like there's historically representative data. How well can one forecast something that's so new like this? It's true that we've got a much richer data set, but we have lots of experience in modeling epidemics. Not at the same scale, but certainly the same sort of dynamics occur. Plus, we've got our daily data for about 15 months. So we have quite a lot of data from a lot of countries in the world. And we've been able to validate our forecasts over that period of time. So certainly in the first month or two, we were scrambling to try to put together something that we thought would work. But for the last year, we've had a lot of information about how the pandemic has been unfolding in different places, what the infection rates are and so on. And we've been able to validate our forecasts against what actually happened and sometimes tweak the model a little bit to improve things as we've gone along. One of the challenges in the last few months has been first some new variants, which means the infection rates have changed. So what we were modeling in 2020 is not the same thing that we're modeling in 2021. We've had multiple variants mutate in different parts of the world and they've then spread. And we've also had vaccinations occurring, which reduces the infection rates. So both of those things need to be taken into account in the current variants of our model. So it's an ongoing process. It's not just one model, leave it and run it every week. We continue to modify the model to take into account changing uh, variants, changing vaccination rates, but and also changing behaviour as people you know, either go back to work or, or mix more in shopping centres or there's lockdown, so they're not mixing at all. We need to take that into account as well. It seems like there's a lot of dynamics going on here. Just the presence of the vaccine alone. I'm happy to report I just got my second shot, but not everyone has yet had access to it on the planet. And sadly, some who have access are sort of opting out uh, in cases where maybe they should take it. Do you have to zoom in and try and predict things at some sort of county level or anything like that? Or does it just kind of net out in the high level statistics? So we're only trying to forecast at state level and we have the states and the territories of Australia, but so they're relatively large compared to the counties in the US. And we're not trying to forecast how quickly the vaccinations roll out because who knows, it depends a lot on political decisions that get made. What we're trying to do is to say, well, given the current situation where we're sitting right now, what's going to happen if there's no change for the next six weeks? So if everyone behaves the same way they're behaving right now, if vaccination rates are unchanged from what they are now, where are we going to be? And then the government can say, well, we need to try to modify people's behaviour. So let's try and get the vaccinations going more quickly, or we might need to initiate a lockdown in a certain state because it looks like things are taking off there. So I guess your primary recipient of the work you guys are doing is really the government to be able to inform what I presume is a variety of different decisions based on what the forecasts are telling them. Do you hear any two-way conversation there? Do people inquire about confidence intervals and the kind of things statisticians like to talk about? Or do you hear anything back at all, really? So we're providing full probabilistic distributions. So not just a point forecast, but we provide them whole probability distributions. And there's been an education requirement there that the politicians and the chief health officers have had to learn a little bit of statistics and understand tail probabilities and things like that. So they've been very good, actually, at getting to grips with the conceptual ideas behind what you mean by a probabilistic forecast. They will also come back with questions about what if we did this, what do you think would happen? So there's been a little bit of that. But most of those sort of questions about what if scenarios with different public policy responses have been handled by other teams. We're not the only team working on this. We're the ones that are providing the forecast conditional on current behavior that's sort of the most detailed and the most sophisticated. But then there's a group of other people doing, you know, if we did this in this state, what do you think is likely to happen? 
if there were a place to improve things, I guess it could be data collection or methodology. There's a lot of ways you could go in and continue to work on this. Where do you think the investment would and should go? Yeah, that's a good question. We've poured quite a lot of resources into this in terms of people and computing power. And so I think we've done really well. What would be good would be to actually start sharing information across countries a little more because every country has been doing the same thing. And we do have some interaction with the teams in other places. So we've had quite close collaborations with some people on the Spanish team and we know well the people in the US team who are working for the CDC and what they're doing. But, you know, if we could pause for a month and sort of stop this scramble to produce forecasts every week, it would actually be really helpful to sit down in a workshop or a conference and just share ideas so that we can each learn from one another about what has worked well in the other teams and then pool ideas and hopefully we could all do a better job. But it's been such a scramble to try to put together good forecasting models every single week for the last 15 months that a lot of those sort of communications in scientific sort of collaborative sense haven't been able to happen. And obviously we can't meet physically as well, which also slows the collaboration down. As you've been working through that process, are there any anecdotes that stand out about, I don't know, a day that was an outlier or or something that shifted that the team had to account for? Uh, So in Australia, we've been very lucky that it's been pretty low level of COVID cases for almost the entire time in every state. The only significant outbreak we've had was in my state of Victoria, which is in the southern part of the country, where in July and August last year, we had a relatively significant outbreak. It got up to about five or 600 cases per day for a short time, which you know is tiny compared to what's happening in some other countries. But in terms of it potentially getting out of control, that's the closest we've come to in Australia. So that was interesting from a forecasting point of view, because we we had actually predicted that. Our models were showing that that was a non negligible probability of happening, that once we were getting cases above 10 per day, we were predicting that it could really take off. And we were advising the government that that was the situation. And when it was at its peak, we were then having to forecast, well, how likely is it to come down now over the next few weeks? Or how likely is it to really get out of control? So that was an interesting test for our models. And I think the models came through really, really well, because what happened was actually within the range of possibilities that we said could happen and the recovery from that where we went down to zero cases again for a very long time was also within what we were predicting was possible to happen. So it was a really good test for the model and we came through it pretty well. Is there anything about the COVID-19 work in particular you think we should delve into? So I've actually done another lot of forecasting around COVID-19 for the government on a different topic, which was they wanted us to forecast tourist numbers. And we got this contract with the Australian government back in late 2019. And we were to forecast tourism numbers for the next five years. And so we started work on it in around November, December 2019. And we'd made some good progress by about January or February. And then we realized that, yeah, we needed to pivot. This was not going to work. And that the pandemic was going to completely destroy any credibility that our forecasts had. And so we started again. And we had to come up with a new methodology for basically how was COVID-19 going to affect tourism numbers in Australia? And when were we likely to recover? And so that's been a really interesting interesting piece of work because you know, obviously there's no data on recovery from a pandemic. So we needed to use a very different forecasting approach involving judgmental methods as well as some statistical counterfactual methods. So the counterfactual method is, well, what would happen if there was no pandemic? And that was relatively easy because we could just use our standard methods. And then using judgmental adjustments to that from many hundreds of tourism experts about when they thought recovery was likely to happen under different scenarios and from different countries. And then we combined those to then come up with some overall forecasts that we gave to the government to help them plan their recovery. It was a very different sort of problem and the timing was was amazing. That If we delivered our forecasts to the government in January or February 2020, you know, they would have been useless. So fortunately, we had time to modify them and come up with something that's actually going to work, I think. I would imagine the government would be understanding that the forecasts are a little up in the air at this point, but very cool that you can still get something out of them. With that in mind, what is the horizon? Do you see a a quick return or what's broadly speaking, what's predicted? One of the issues is the width of our prediction intervals are pretty wide in terms of what's going to happen because of the high level of uncertainty around how quickly countries will vaccinate and when will the virus settle down. So, yeah, the optimistic scenario was sort of returning to 2019 levels by around the end of 2023. The pessimistic scenario is going to be take a few more years than that. So we don't see a recovery to anything like, you know, what we 
used to have in terms of tourism in Australia for at least another two years and probably longer. Yeah, that seems in line with my expectations. Sad but true, I guess. Well, let's circle back and talk about the book a little bit, starting with where can people find it online? The website is otexts.com slash fpp3. So otexts.com is O-T-E-X-T-S dot com. So that's a little publishing company I set up largely to publish this book because I wasn't interested in working with a commercial publisher. And FPP3 stands for Forecasting Principles and Practice third edition. So if you go there, the book is free and online, and it'll give you instructions about how to download the software, which is all in R, and also open source and free. So part of the idea of writing the book was to make it accessible to a much wider range of people than previously had access to good forecasting resources, not only our own students, but also people with you know, resource constraints. They might be in developing countries and just don't have access to good textbooks or good software and couldn't afford some of the commercial software. So the idea I had was to write a free book and put it with free open source tools that's very high quality, as good as anything commercial or better. And I think we've done something that's better in both the book and the software so that everyone can use it. And so it's been really good to see the pickup in that and how people have really taken to it and started using it. And I think it's probably the most widely used software in the forecasting world and the most widely used book in the forecasting world now with, I think I said before, about 3 million downloads last year for the software and about 20,000 people online every day for the book. So it's, it's, you know, it's really is having an impact, which is nice to see. And I'm always happy to have feedback on both the book and the software about things we can do better. And because they're both online and open access, they're easy for me to update. You know, as soon as someone says oh, there's a typo or there's a bug, I, I fix it within a day. Well, I didn't find any on my read through. So for that and other reasons, it's highly recommended for me. Was there anywhere people can follow you personally online? Yeah, the best place to follow me is on Twitter, Rob J. Hindman. And then there's my website, robjhindman.com. Rob, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise. It's been a pleasure. Great to talk to you, Carl. Our guest today was Rob Hindman. Check out Forecasting Principles and Practice, available at otexts.com. Claudia Armbruster is our associate producer, Vanessa Blyde is guest coordination, and I've been your host, Kyle Polich. <laughs>